If you have dabbled with the inner workings of a PC, you may have come across reference to RAID. In most PCs these days, it is possible to combine disks using RAID. PCs won't typically support many RAID levels, but it can be a useful option if you need more capacity or performance. Though with performance in mind, the simplest option is to use an SSD as your primary disk. RAID in this context is sometimes referred to as software RAID. This is because the function of combining the disks and running those parity calculations is done by the operating system. This might be quite a small overhead on system performance, but it is an overhead. In servers and shared storage systems, the demands on the storage are much higher, so we need to use hardware to perform this RAID function. This leads us to the idea of a RAID controller. A RAID controller typically connects to the PCIe expansion bus within a PC or server. In some systems, it may be embedded on the motherboard. They are also used in external storage systems and in some cases, manufacturers may design in extra functionality beyond standard RAID. The purpose of a hardware RAID controller is to offload storage-related processing away from the computer's central processing unit, the CPU. It can bring additional benefits relating to manageability and serviceability. I'll get to these shortly. Let's see how this works. The controller typically has SAS connectors which can either connect to internal drives or out to external drives which are housed in a disk tray. This is a JBOD, just a bunch of disks. The disk enclosure has no processing capability. It simply connects disks to the RAID controller. The back of the tray will include connectors for each individual drive, connected via a backplane. The disk enclosure will also include at least one power supply unit, or PSU. This is used to power the disks. The reason for having more than one PSU is redundancy, to protect against failures. The RAID controller itself has processing capability, some cache memory for temporary storage of data, and often some electronics, which can help with low-level processing like parity calculations. These cards are highly tuned for a specialised job, getting data on and off disks as fast as possible. The cache memory is highly important. It enables the card to onboard relatively big chunks of data, carve it into blocks ready for striping across the drives, then essentially writing to each drive in parallel. This is how the performance advantage of striping is maximised. The more disks, the faster data can be transferred. So what about the M and S on the end of spams? Manageability is an important function in any equipment designed for a data centre. This is because management of these systems is always done remotely. The fewer people ever entering the data center, the better. The RAID controller has manageability built in. This helps with these tasks. Sending an alert if a disk drive fails, or even if starting to fail, a pre-failure alert. Allowing interrogation of status, for example, quantity of drives, specs for each one, how much they are being used, etc. And capturing performance and reliability statistics, for example, throughput rates of data or temperature of the card. Knowing that a storage drive is about to fail is critically important. Think back to how RAID 5 protects against failures. If a single disk fails, we can carry on accessing the data. But if a second drive fails, the data is lost. This means when a drive fails, we enter a high-risk period. If the drives are of a similar age, which they often will be, statistically, when one drive fails, there is a higher chance a second one might follow. One way a RAID controller can help is to provide a hot spare capability. This is common in storage systems in data centers. Let's say we have three drives in a RAID 5 group. We also have a spare drive inserted in the tray. When a drive fails, the controller can rebuild the data from the failed drive and copy it into the spare drive. Once built, 
the spare drive takes the place of the failed drive and we are back to normal operation. By the way, rebuilding a drive can take hours to days depending on the capacity and speed of the drive. This is also an additional load on the RAID controller and in some cases performance for the storage system can be degraded during this period. Whether we have a hot spare or not, a failed drive needs replacing. Downtime in a data center is to be avoided at all costs, so turning off the storage system or the server just so a failed drive can be replaced is not an option. This leads to the concept of hot pluggable drives. Disk trays in data centers do not physically connect to SAS drives directly. Instead, the drives are packed inside a carrier or sometimes called a caddy. This has a much more robust connector at the back designed for being pulled in and out often. The caddy is designed to slot in using guardrails to ensure good alignment with the connector. At the front, there is typically a latch mechanism to keep the drive secure. Often a little handle pops out when unlatched so an engineer can easily extract the drive without using tools. The front of the drive will also have an LED to indicate if the drive is functioning or failed. Faced with a rack of drives, imagine how hard it would be to determine the right drive without this. Note that the design of the caddies and the disk trays vary by manufacturer. This is how they retain the revenue stream as disks are added. Although the disks themselves are industry standard, only drives and caddies from that manufacturer are supported. This also enables them to have better control over pricing. This is another reason the cost per terabyte in a data center is much higher than at home. Organizations continue to pay this premium because the value they get in return is reflected in overall reliability. Also, most systems come with a service contract, which means disk failures, including the physical replacement of drives, is covered by the manufacturer. The idea of hot pluggable components and hot spares is used throughout data centers. For example, the PSUs in disk trays can often be pulled out for replacement, while the other, or others, sometimes might be three in total, take the load in the meantime. Just one final thought on the RAID controller. In the setup I described, we can protect against disk failures, but we cannot protect against failure in the RAID card itself. It is in fact a single point of failure. In the next lesson, we will look at the architecture of shared storage systems. Here, you'll see how we can overcome this limitation.